The conditions in Japanese prisons are rough. I knew that much before I even started making this video. But to be honest, it was originally supposed to be like six minutes long. As I researched more and more, I just kept learning horrific thing after horrific thing. Unlike my other videos, this one is not lighthearted. There are gruesome retellings of actual torture and death at the hands of prison guards later in the video. Just letting you know. I got intercepted on my way to work by an innocent looking dude. He flashed me his badge, asked me to ID myself. Next thing I know, six other people appeared out of nowhere. I spent 20 days in Japanese detention. Ask me anything? They presented a court order to search my apartment, still not telling me what I did. They took pictures of everything. Me unlocking the door. Me allowing them to go inside, etc. Inside, they then started searching everything. Inside protein powder, tea bags, under the bed, closets, clothes. And asked questions if I ever had something intercepted by customs, and if I had any idea why they were here. I said I was clueless. Then they showed me a court order to arrest me. If you didn't know already, along with other Asian countries, Japan has some of the harshest drug laws in the world. Just for being caught with possession of marijuana, you can be sentenced to up to five years imprisonment and probably deportation if you're a foreigner. But not just possession, just having the drugs in your system is enough to be charged for drug use. This doesn't currently apply to specifically marijuana usage, but as of last year, they want to change the law so it does. So if the law was changed, if you were at a party and took a drag from what you thought was a hand-rolled cigarette, but it actually had some weed in it, you could go to prison for up to five years, or face deportation and separation from your wife, kids, job, or family. Additionally, there are many stories online of people who live in Japan having their well-meaning friends from their home country send them drugs, sometimes even unsolicited, and having their lives ruined for it. Here are a few examples I've found on the internet. This person talks about how an English teacher was mailed a quarter ounce of weed in a jar of peanut butter, they were caught and their life was ruined. This one talks about someone who mailed their Japanese friend some weed from California and how getting caught negatively impacted both of their lives. This long one is from the perspective of a really dumb guy who mailed his Japanese friend who barely even asked for them some seeds. The package got intercepted and now he's asking for legal advice. Finally, there's a big story I have to show you about an autistic Norwegian girl who was arrested in Japan for being unknowingly sent marijuana in the mail, but we'll get into that later in the video. Back to our main Ask Me Anything story. Next thing I know, I was cuffed and driven to the police station. I wasn't allowed contact with anyone, not even my company to tell them that I wouldn't be at work. They take his fingerprints, change him into some clothes they had prepared, and then... They threw me into a little cell with one other guy. There was absolutely nothing in it besides a small, squat toilet cabin with a big window. This is the floor plan of an average Japanese jail cell. Here's some pictures from inside. You can see the toilet at the back. You forgot the part where you have to flush frequently in order not to stink up the cell with 10 others in it. Yeah, and while you're sitting, you're at the perfect height for everyone to make eye contact with you. The first guy that went obviously didn't know, and got an earful from some Yakuza types. Big signs everywhere to tell you that you're not allowed to talk. If you did, police would come and tell you to shush. It's about time I introduce you to THE DOCUMENT. In 1994, Human Rights Watch released an extremely critical report detailing how awful the Japanese prison conditions are. It's 131 pages long, so I didn't read all of it, but there are parts I will refer to in this video. A male prisoner currently in the Tokyo Detention Center told Human Rights Watch that he has not spoken to another prisoner since his arrival from police detention in 1988, six years. If I spoke, I would be punished, he reported. A prisoner who has been held for 13 years in the Osaka Detention Center reported that he has had no contact with other prisoners throughout his detention. He said that in order to communicate with inmates held in the same center, he would have to do it in writing. A former female prisoner had spent 12 years in the Tokyo Detention Center. She told us, I was always alone, all the time by myself. I couldn't talk to anyone. She said that even when she was taken outside her cell to see a doctor or for a visit, the authorities made sure that the hallway was empty. On rare occasions when there was another prisoner in the hallway, 
he or she would be made to face the wall when our witness walked by. When I mentioned the document being from 1994, you probably thought the same thing. That's 1994, it's 2022 now, or whatever year you're watching this video in. But there hasn't really been much reform in the Japanese prison system at all. The Japanese prison law dates to 1908, making it possibly one of the oldest such documents still in effect anywhere in the world. Both the critics of the government and the government itself agree on the need for new, more modern legislation. Since 1982, the government has repeatedly tried to have a new prison law passed by the Diet. That's the parliament or whatever. I don't know why it's called the Diet. Wow! So, prison reform in Japan. There has been some reform in 2005, but it didn't really address the problems that we're covering in this video. As for the reason the reform happened in 2005, this is from the Center for Prisoners' Rights Japan. Nagoya Prison Cases and Recommendation of the Council on Prison Administration Reform. This is a translated document, so it might sound a little weird. Notorious torture cases occurred in a chronic overcrowded prison. Three sentenced prisoners died or were injured as a result of the guards' assaults in the Nagoya prison from 2001 to 2002. On December 14, 2001, a 43-year-old male prisoner who was detained in a protection room, isolation room, to detain a prisoner who shows signs of suicide or self-injury, died after guards sprayed a high-pressure hose at his naked buttocks. The prisoner died because of severe injury to his rectum and bacterial shock. On May 27, 2002, a 49-year-old male prisoner died after being left in a protection room. The prison guards fastened the prisoner's leather handcuffs too tight and he died of heart failure. On September 25, 2002, a 30-year-old male prisoner was severely injured because of intra-abdominal bleeding and hospitalized outside after he was also bound too tightly with leather handcuffs by guards. Eight prison guards involved in a series of these cases were indicted for causing death or injury by violence and cruelty by a special public official. These assaults on prisoners by guards clearly consist of torture. Especially concerning the incident which occurred in September 2002, the guards did violence to the prisoner for the purpose of forcing him to dismiss his complaint to the Bar Association. Which is true, the guy who was tortured to death in 2002 was actually being punished for complaining. This treatment had been inflicted to him on 25th September 2002, and the allegation went that it represented a punishment for his refusal to withdraw an earlier complaint he had made to the Justice Minister. Yamashita had indeed filed a grievance about his guards to the incumbent MOJ's head. MOJ is Ministry of Justice, I believe. So there have been some changes to the law in 2005 that address the things we just looked at that happened in 2001 and 2002, but it was nowhere near enough. All of the other prison experiences I discuss in this video take place after 2005. Back to our main story. And here begins the nightmare. The timetable looks like this. 7 a.m. Lights turn on. Well, turn on. We never really turn off. Just go from bright white to less bright orange. Take the sheets off your futon, fold everything neatly together and put it away when it's your turn. Then brush your teeth and wash your face. Then clean your cell with your cellmates. Clean the toilet, wipe the floor, etc. 7.30 to 8. Breakfast. Then you can decide if you want to change your underwear, t-shirt and socks. 8.30. Cell check. Fold your socks neatly in front of you. Sit next to them. Put your hands on your knees, facing up to show that you're not holding anything. 9 o'clock. Work out. You can go into a different small room without a ceiling to get some sunlight and fresh air for 20 minutes. 12 o'clock. Lunch. 5 p.m. Dinner. 7 p.m. Take out your futon. Put the sheets on. Wash face. Brush teeth. 9 p.m. Lights off. Well, turning to less bright but still bright orange. And then sleeping time. The rest of the time you literally do nothing. You sit or lay in your cell on the hard floor, wishing you could sleep so that time passes faster, but you can't. It's too bright. And after a while, every part of your body you try laying on hurts. If you try using socks or a sweater as a cushion, you get told off by guards if they see it. I'd like to remind you, this Reddit guy has not been convicted of a crime. In fact, he was let go in the end without any charges. But the Japanese jail system allows you to be detained for up to 23 days in a police cell, no contact with anyone in these awful conditions without even being charged. This graph is from a group called the Japan Federation of Bar Associations that also seems to be seeking prison reform in Japan. It comes from a document criticizing this so-called Daiyo Kangoku system, which is what allows this awful practice. 
Under the law, suspects are to be detained in prisons, kangoku, under the control of the Ministry of Justice. But in circumstances which unavoidably make it impossible to detain them in prisons, provisions of the prison law allow the police the use of cells as a substitute. So they're only supposed to use it when it's impossible to detain suspects in a detention center, but in reality, they actually use it in 98% of cases. They give some really scary examples. Yeah, we're getting into this stuff again. In April 2003, 10-odd people were detained in police station cells, and almost all of them were subjected to interrogation from 9am to 9pm nearly every day. Interrogators yelled things like, don't lie, and you're getting the death penalty, kicked and slammed tables, made suspects keep their hands up on the tables, and in other ways conducted extremely harsh interrogations. Additionally, they deceived suspects and offered inducements during questioning. In the trial, all 12 defendants were acquitted. The court's decision recognized, among other things, that the defendants' confessions might be bogus because during their detention they had been subjected to considerably harsh interrogations in which interrogators coerced and pressured them. In October 2003, the mayor of Haki in Fukuoka was arrested and detained in Daiyo Kangoku on the charge that she had swindled someone out of their tax refund. Interrogators kicked the table, blew cigarette smoke in her face, yelled in her ears, screamed at her all day, and when she had tea in the mornings and afternoons, interrogators accused her of trying to avoid interrogation by drinking tea so she would have to go to the lavatory. As a result, she became unable to drink tea. Even after going to bed, police officers were always present so that she was deprived of privacy 24 hours a day. In April 2005, the defendant's acquittal was confirmed. These tactics of making conditions miserable for suspects and keeping them in the interrogation room for as long as possible are purposeful confession extraction tactics. The proof is in these excerpts from the Guidelines for the Interrogation of Suspects from 2001. In addition to further criticism from Human Rights Watch, this Daiyo Kangok system has been criticized in 2007 by the UN Committee Against Torture, asking for its abolition, and in 2008 by Algeria, Belgium, the UK, and Canada through the UN Human Rights Council. Did you ever question your sanity because you only saw the same four walls all day? How big were the cells? Questioned the fuck out of my sanity. The cell was three tatami mats plus a squatter toilet with a window. I read, drew pictures, did push-ups, chatted with my cellmate, slept, and did everything I could to quiet the voice in my head that was perpetually screaming, Get me the fuck out of here! I realized that there's a lot of suffering in the world, but for me, being locked in a cage for over 23 hours a day was a hell that made me understand why the toilet door was sloped, so that it wasn't possible to hang yourself from it. I often wanted to die. All right, I promised you I'd get back to this Norwegian girl. You can already guess the story. Ingrid, a 32-year-old autistic master's student in Tokyo, said someone's cookies looked nice on Twitter, and the person offered to mail them to her. Ingrid had no idea they contained weed. She doesn't even smoke tobacco or drink alcohol. Seven months later, they arrested not Ingrid, but her friend returning to Japan because Ingrid was house-sitting at the time, so she gave the Twitter cookie person her friend's address. Her friend was interrogated for several hours up to three times per day. The strap around her waist, by her described as a corset, was tightened so hard that it became difficult to breathe. Several times she thought she was about to be rendered unconscious. She tried to use what little breath she had to tell the prison guards that the strap was too tight so she couldn't breathe, but they didn't seem to care. The guards would tighten the strap further as they pleased. She was handcuffed in a way that left wounds on her wrists. If detainees screamed or cried out in pain, they would be put in solitary isolation. The police knew that she was innocent. They subpoenaed the data from Twitter already, and they knew that she never talked about drugs, just cookies. Even after that, they released her friend and arrested Ingrid instead, interrogating her for 20 days for a crime they already knew she didn't commit. A visibly exhausted Ingrid left detention after 20 days on December 10th, immediately calling her family in Norway to let them know she was okay. Allowed a shower only once in five days, she first wanted to get cleaned up and see her pet bird. Police have finally acknowledged that Ingrid had nothing whatsoever to do with the marijuana found in the package, and the case was expected to be closed. Ingrid had always been a great fan of Japan, but told the media upon her release, It has always been my dream to stay here, but after processing what has happened, I may not want to stay. 
She still had her graduate degree to finish at Sofia University. I don't often sympathize with insanely wealthy people, but I can't pretend that I don't understand why Carlos Ghosn chose to be secretly smuggled out of Japan inside an instrument box instead of facing the justice system's 99.4% conviction rate. Honestly, I originally intended on just covering the Reddit Ask Me Anything. But here we are, almost three weeks late on the video release because I just keep finding out more and more disgusting stuff that I didn't want to know. Most of which I couldn't even fit in the video. I've always been incredibly passionate about prison reform in Japan, so if you're still watching this video, I'm glad I was able to retain your focus for so long. Thank you very much for watching. Sorry it was a little sad. See you, uh, next time.